And welcome. I'm Michelle Sayer. I'm nursing faculty at MSU, and I'm also the director of Nurses for Nurses International Foundation. And we do some work overseas. But this last summer, we had the great privilege of uh, joining the Bioregions team, which is out of Montana State University. It has an affiliation there. And we went for five weeks to Mongolia. And one of the stars of our show is up there in the uh, Audience, there's Lauren, and um, uh, she can she can add maybe some thoughts as we go along here. So the title of this presentation is 16 Horses to Every Person," and the challenges that that creates in healthcare uh, for both the the good and the bad, but just the joy and the privilege of having been to Mongolia this last summer, and then the months of work that led up to being able to go. Look at this darling little girl. She was at one of the screenings, and the children are beautiful. It was just a real privilege to be there. So this, uh, there's Lauren right there in the front, and there's Peter Cohen right there in the front. Hi. Did you start? I started. Well, let me do an introduction. Okay, he wants to do an introduction. Hey, welcome. Um, and uh, tonight we're in for a real treat. We have. Michelle Sayre here to talk about something really recent, her work in uh, Mongolia this past summer, and she's titled her talk, 16 Horses to Every Person, Challenges to Healthcare Delivery in Rural Mongolia. Uh, certainly in a state that has a lot of horses like Montana, this should be something that we're very interested in. Um, Michelle has dedicated the majority of her professional life, nearly 40 years, to improving health in rural and resource poor communities. Nurses for Nurses International Foundation, which she founded, works to close the gap between disparity and inequity in healthcare in resource poor communities in Haiti, Montana, Mongolia, and Nicaragua. They do this through the skill, knowledge, and attributes and strengths of the world's largest professional healthcare workers that is, nurses. She has also authored several internationally distributed texts and remains a speaker, trainer, university level professor uh, here in Missoula for the uh, Missoula, uh, for the Montana Nursing Program and a um, advocate and consultant for rural and frontier public health. She has helped design and implement successful impl uh, legislation and delivered innovative and responsive educational offerings in Indonesia, Haiti, Mongolia, and across several U.S. states. Michelle knows what it takes to affect change and to address the tough choices in healthcare. So with this as background, we look forward to what Michelle Sayre has to share with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is, uh, these are the three students that I had the privilege to work with. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, there's uh, Jesse Harden, uh, Lauren Robson, and Oriana Turley. And they're um, sitting there looking at some of those 16 horses. This was one of our campsites. These horses would come in every morning to water. There'd be hundreds and hundreds that would splash into this little, little miniature lake. Then uh, the horses had the first shot at the water. Then uh, the cattle had the second shot, and the goats and the sheep you know, had a distance third to get into the water. So uh, they were just everywhere. So what's similar about Montana and Mongolia? And uh, we, it is four times the size of Montana. And it is uh, the year, <coughs> excuse me, the yearly earnings in Mongolia are quite a bit less at about 2,000 per person. And that, of course, compares to our national US average of 42,000. Uh, the industries are mining. And there is some manufacturing, but there's a lot of wool products, mostly cashmere. Uh, as I understand, and I learned once I was there, that Gobi, Gobi, I don't know, 
stores? How many of you know about that? Oh, it was like everybody I was with on the team just immediately had this radar to go sho shopping at Gobi, and it was pretty impressive, but um, it was for people who made a lot more than $2,000 a year. Uh, anyway, the way of life there, it continues to be predominantly rural once you're outside of Ulaanbaatar and nomadic herdsmen. And then the shared uh, rural and agricultural and mining heritage was very interesting to us. How, uh, what we learn here in Montana, what is going on in Mongolia, and, and what can we learn from them, what are some of the same challenges, etc. And then we also have a lot of the same uh, shared health care challenges with long distances, access to health care, and some of the other problems. So we thought it was a very good fit for a cross-national partnership, and we're continuing to work on that. Um, so it's huge. It's a beautiful, beautiful country. We didn't make it into the southern part of the country, which is mostly the Gobi Desert, uh, but it's 1.6 million square kilometers, and pretty much everywhere you go, this is what it looks like. Just land as far as you can see and beautiful, beautiful blue sky. Anyone here been to Mongolia? Oh, well, besides Lauren. <laughs> Amazing, really a beautiful country and beautiful people. Uh, this is our flag. The blue stands for the eternal blue sky, which was absolutely appropriate. Um, and then the, the red stands for their withstanding a lot of hardship. And that wasn't too tough to see, that life there is not a piece of cake. Uh, the, the weather can be horrendous. Uh, my, my big crisis was my tent flooding a couple times. Uh, but those little things in life can be kind of miserable. But anyway, and then the yellow symbol there that you see stands for the fire, sun, moon, earth, and water. They are very connected to the earth. They're very in tune to the seasons. And I've got to say, while it's not a subject here, I could spend a whole uh, spiel on their animal husbandry and their communication and, and training skills with their livestock. There would be uh, flocks of, there's no fences, and there's no way to control. We have corrals here and uh, shoots and all kinds of things to control our critters. But there, if two herds of sheep got together, you would think, well, that's a wreck. But they just quietly walk in between and just out there in the middle of thousands of acres of nowhere and separate them. And they have a real gentleness. Um, the other thing that would be fun for you to learn someday is what a real Mongolian cowboy can do. We won't do that today, but holy cats. <laughs> so anyway, these are the students that went. They were um, uh, semester, senior semester one students. And we went for the five week adventure. And here we're being welcomed at the university in um, uh, Ulaanbaatar. So the focus of our team was to provide mentoring, service training, attend home visits and help problem solve. We demonstrated some collaboration and mentoring staffing and we delivered some screenings. Now, how many of you have been on overseas work, missions, assignments of any kind? Okay, <clears throat> I mean this with great respect, but we often go with our ideas. Here's what we're going to provide for you. And it always kind of turns around, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, what we learned from them, okay. And we also had a privilege, the students wrote um, an undergraduate scholar program grant and received that. So we were doing research over there on nursing, <coughs> excuse me, rural theory, etc. So that was a lot of fun. And the students put together a poster and actually at the International Rural um, Conference won second place out of 37 internationally mentored uh, posters. So we had a lot of fun, learned a lot about nursing, rural nursing, applied it to some theories that we've developed at MSU, etc. So pretty cool. Well, the truth was, it was shocking. Does anybody know what this is a map of? It's the Mongolian Empire. And you know what's shocking? Is that's about the extent of my knowledge before I went to Mongolia. I couldn't honestly tell you much about Mongolia. How many of you right now would love to have a little geography and history quiz on Mongolia? <laughs> and and it, your grade, your graduation depends on it. <laughs> that was like our whole team. 
We were going off to this country, and it was hard to find information. Uh, you'd see this scholarly article, or you could go look at the World Health Organization's data, and or, of course the CIA has their data. But in terms of really an understanding, it was sort of fascinating to me how little I knew, and um, really couldn't find a lot. Everybody knows Genghis Khan, right? Okay, no we don't. That's not his name. We all have been saying it wrong. It's Chinggis. Did I say it right, Lauren? It's Chinggis Khan. You know, so we didn't even have that right. So, okay, so it's shocking. I really was ignorant and continue to be ignorant uh, about Mongolia. This was Mongolian in 1279. Uh, this was, uh, you can see there, this is the Russian uh, USSR influence in 1960, and you can see the Mongolia was part of that. Now, if you would have put that on a test question and asked me about that, I would have said, oh, I think that's, I think that's the Mongolian Empire. You know, I really didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know the people. I didn't know the culture. I didn't know the politics. I didn't know the history. And I think that's fairly common. So I had to locate it on a map. <laughs> so this is where it is. I actually had the audacity to talk to a young Mongolian that was here in school. And I said, so do you have, a, do you have any borders that touch the ocean? <laughs> I mean, I was really that far off, OK? Because it was just kind of this fuzzy spot. In my mind, Mongolia was gigantic. And I, I think I've always seen it as kind of the Mongolian empire and never really tracked its history after that. It didn't understand its significance in, in, in our world, et cetera. So here's the interesting thing. Um, this is only, of course, a small piece of the original Mongolia. And um, it broke away from China. Anybody know when? 1910. Now here's the, so much I don't know, it's fascinating. That was the, the collapse of the, the Chinese Empire, was about that time. And that's why Mongolia was able to pull away. And there's, they've always had Russia as kind of a protector role, if you look at some of the history. But basically, they became a Russian, not a Russian state. They did not become part of the USSR. But their politics, their infrastructure, their building was very much governed. Even though they were the Mongolian Republic, they were governed by Russia from about 1921 Anybody know when Mongolia became an uh, independent democracy? Not very long ago, it was 1992. That's pretty young. That's pretty young. So if we start thinking, well, what's that mean? How does that impact healthcare? How does that impact global health? How does that impact uh, our understanding, knowledge, the, the place of, of um, our relationship with Mongolia or anyone else's in this world? You know what's interesting? There's not one Gates grant awarded in Mongolia. Why would you think that's significant? You think there's any political connections there? Would you guess, maybe? Yeah, it's not that the need doesn't exist. It's that they are still a country a little bit in limbo. Right now they're having some political challenges with their president and things right now. So they're, they're really, 1992, that's a pretty baby country. Okay, so that's where we're headed. And here's a little bit about Mongolia. Um, the 90% of the, the um, uh, language and whatnot is Kalaka. Does anybody know how to pronounce that any better than I did? Okay, and then there's Turkic. Um, the religious beliefs were very interesting and very powerful there. Uh, Buddhists account for 53%, depending who you speak with, they may say it's higher than that. Muslim 3, Christian 2.2, Shamanist 2.9, and other. Um, and then they say there's none. It's actually considered an atheist, the national language is an atheist state. But everywhere you go, no matter uh, even within the city of Ulaanbaatar, which is a population of about 1. Point, I think it's about 1.9 million, they have these little blue things. Anybody know what these little blue things are? They're a Buddhist. They're one of the colors of Buddhist. This particular one means good fortune to you, good blessing. So if you give someone a gift, 
you would, you would set the gift here and hand it to them. And this is tied around random little stakes, and there'll be, there'll be um, hundreds of these tied around these stakes on a pile of rocks out in the middle of nowhere, meaning to bless that land. And this is a Buddhist, but it's kind of combined with shamanist, because then you have to tie your little blue blessing around this stake, then you go around it clockwise three times, and then you have to add, is it three rocks or two rocks? You don't remember? You have to add rocks to add blessings. And so you can tell just by being in the country how significant um, their spiritual religious beliefs are to their daily life. And certainly when you want to impact any kind of health care or work with the population, you have to understand these, this stuff. So a little history. Jingus uh, was in the 13th. Uh, century. He's called the father. Um, 14th century broke apart with all the Mongol regions. 17th century, it was under Chinese rule. 1921, it won independence from China with Russians' help, but it became a communist state in 1924. And it's not in the history books. I can find no historical uh, uh, reference to it, but one of our interpreters um, told me stories about that time when all the monks um, and anyone who was educated and all of the books were put into gares. You might have heard these called yurts, but in, in Mongolia they're called gares. And they were killed and they were burnt. And there's only one monastery that's still uh, functional in Ulaanbaatar. And they've all been, they were all destroyed. Uh, it's kind of a, a dark, silent part of their history. Um, but imagine losing all of your scholars, your books, your, um, and your monks, your religious leaders. So, so it's all their, their spirituality and their religion and their politics um, are all pretty, pretty deeply entwined. Anyway, 1992 was their peaceful democratic revolution uh, without elections, and if you recall at that time, that was the breakup of the USSR. And so there was nothing really to fight against. They were busy doing other stuff. So that's a little bit about um, the background of my inky, dinky bit of knowledge about uh, Mongolia. And uh, it certainly is continuing to have a political changes. Uh, right now, they're trying to figure out their system. So the capital is Ulaanbaatar. Oh, it's 1.18 million. That's about 40% of their population. Another 28% of the persons live urban. And by urban, we mean cities, uh, I think the largest one is 58,000 outside of the capital. And the rest of the folks live at rural. And when I mean rural, I mean rural, like, like Montana frontier. And uh, the total population then, of course, is 2.9 million. Uh, demography, the population growth rate is pretty low, 1.17. Life expectancy is uh, up from uh, 1999 by almost five years. And you can see, though, they're lagging behind the US by about 10 years. Literacy rate, look at that, 98%. There's some counties in Montana we can't count 98% literacy rate. So that's pretty cool. Can you imagine why that is? They were communists. They were communists, yes. You will. You will go to school. <laughs> so, okay. Um, but what's interesting is the number of health care providers, if we're going to talk health care, to population. There's 2.7 doctors to the 1,000 population, which isn't much different than here in the United States. They actually train quite a few doctors. But the years of medical school are about four to five years and are very... Um, uh, in 1998, I was uh, speaking to someone there that the actual school of nursing curriculum was a little paper handbook from Russia in 1950, and that was their school of nursing curriculum. Their medical curriculum was very similar. It was like a 1950 two pamphlets, and the, the actual education was very, very similar. So um, between the nurses and doctors. So there's 3.5 nurses to 1,000. Here in the US, we have 9.8. If we have uh, more 
excuse me, uh, our ratio of 1 to 110 is a nursing shortage. So they don't have a lot of nurses. And like here in Montana, it's very difficult to get your health care workforce out to the dingleberries. And um, they have a mandated government program. So they actually, and nursing students sitting up there, we might think of this might be a good idea. We go and go, you, 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 we're choosing and you're gonna go work in frontier Mongolia. How would you like that? They don't like it either. So if you don't have a happy workforce, that might be one of the challenges. One of the other things about infrastructure and systems, they have a power grid to all the cities, but this fascinated me. Every GAIR had, a, do you see the satellite sitting there? They have a television. They also had a satellite phone. So that's one of the good things the Russian system established was a communication system because they wanted to be able to communicate with the population and tell them what they wanted them to know. So that's a blessing now when it comes time to health care. And instead of trying to get electricity, could you imagine running wires those miles and miles to these folks? They have solar and they're really developing that. Uh, and the other problem is they can't really decide this is where this person's living, therefore I'm gonna put a power grid there because this person will move three to four times from spring to summer, moving with their animals. So systems that get in place to help support what we can do for folks. Isn't that beautiful country? And that's a gear. If you've seen a gear, this particular one has a canvas on the outside and that's pretty typical now. And then there's a thick felt. And then inside they decorate it with, we d I didn't take any pictures inside gears because I'd be kind of rude. Um, but there are some really beautiful rugs and they're, they're quite amazing. So a little bit about the urban areas because that closely links with whether or not we're gonna have access to healthcare for our rural and frontier folks. Again, that Russian dominance, Apparently, you can tell which era uh, by the height of the building, uh, whether it was a, a Lenin building, a Stalin building, a Khrushchev, or a, or a Gorbachev building. Um, but look at this is, this is a picture from today. You see the guard and the tower? These were kind of scary buildings to go in. And these guys have guns. Not quite sure what's going on there. We asked if it was security, and it was just like, be quiet. Just go in the building. And there's always two big, thick doors to go through, security doors to get into the apartments and buildings. Uh, it was very fascinating. You can see the outside of these buildings are in pretty, I don't know if you can, but they're pretty bad disrepair. But when you walked inside, they're absolutely beautiful. People had fixed everything up. So um, anyway, this is where we were headed as a team um, out into rural Mongolia, we were going specifically to an area called the Bulgan province. And you can see that's right up there in northern uh, Mongolia. And it had, uh, it's got 16, they're called bags, B-A-G-H's, which is an area within each um, uh, province. This is the Bulgan province. The arrow is pointing to Orkholm, and that was the little area we were going to. It was bag five in the Bulgan province, and Bulgan was, is the capital there. Okay, so here we are out there with the sheep, and we had these cars that transported us. Um, we'd load up, and we moved six times. Oh, by the way, the gear door, you can tell which direction this uh, is oriented. The gear doors are always facing south. And that's for good fortune and health and air and light. Um, pretty amazing. It's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful country. This is the city of Erdenet. We took a train to Erdenet, and it was up north. And then we drove and drove and drove and drove and drove and drove. And then we drove some more. Uh, and then we would set up camp. But this is a very typical view of uh, some of the areas where people would be camping. Uh, for their spring with their animals. And I don't know if you can make that out, but down here, the animals have all come in at night, and there are gares there. And one of those gares is the oldest woman that they knew of in Mongolia. She's 101 years old. We got to go do a home visit there. Anyway, our very, very first stop was at the University Health Science, the Health Science University in um, Mongolia there in Ulaanbaatar. And the woman, 
on, what's that going to be, on your left, uh, she is one of only two PhD prepared nurses in the country. PhDs are very unusual. Um, it was pretty exciting and she was a lovely person. So we toured there, we were welcomed and there's where we went to on the train route up to Air Dinette. and there we are on the train. It was quite lovely except that the scary guard on the, on the train kept making us buy things and she wouldn't let us sleep until we did. And when I said, thank you, I thought she was going to smack me. She was kind of scary, wasn't she? Yeah. Um, anyway, other than that, it was lovely. It was beautiful, beautiful country. And as you go through the countryside heading north from Ulaanbaatar up to uh, Erdinet and then into the Orkholm Somme, you could see relics of um, it, sort of the history. Because when the Russians pulled out in 1992, Basically, they were left without infrastructure. Except for the trains, there's very little uh, modern infrastructure. Um, and so Mongolians are having to learn to uh, take care of buildings and maintenance and things that were managed before. Okay, so we toured a copper mine and a farm and I wanted to show you this giant piece of equipment. Now, I, sh I showed you where we were up by Erdinette, way up north. Turbot actually bought this in Beijing. Any of you farmers or got p equipment? He drove that all the way up to northern Mongolia. It's the only way to get it there, okay? Um, I don't know how many days. That probably would have gone at uh, a whopping 10 miles an hour. So anyway, then we went to bag one and we got moved in. This is where we, we lived and there was our friendly outhouse that you'd be sure you wanted to take your light because the hole was quite big and there was only two boards. And this was the country where we were just um, forever and ever. You really didn't see much except an occasional gare. Um, this is the little hospital in uh, Orkholm Somme. This is the main hospital. There is some electricity being run there. I didn't get the picture that shows that the hospital has to use an outhouse and they had no running water. So we're being shown around the hospital in bag four, or excuse me, it's in bag five. Um, and it's just an area when they say bag. Um, I don't know if you can look around at that picture just a little bit to look at like you can start guessing at age of architecture, but there's no running water. This was a, uh, the medication room. Um, very primitive uh, still. Um, this was the maternity and peds room. We had the privilege of taking in a uh, little Doppler and two mothers for the first time heard uh, their baby's heartbeat and both the mothers were in really need of hearing that everything was okay. They had a Doppler there for that but it hadn't worked they said for several years. So um, this is the pharmacy and uh, we're actually looking at the um, display that is the complementary and alternative medications. They use those together. Um, they don't really have a study of the uh, interactions or complexity. Uh, so the pharmacology, they had a particular formulary of what they use, but they had no idea what mixed or matched and what one medication did with the other. So very interesting, but very, very dedicated, lovely people. Um, but there's the pharmacy for the hospital. And this, do you know what this is? That's the ambulance. Yeah, it's an old German Jeep. And it was just lovely. The back was covered with um, uh, pretty Mongolian carpets. I don't know why I don't have to turn the back on. Oh, I did just die. There's a little button on the top. That do any good? That do any good? Can you hear me now? <laughs> well, I can still hear you. Can I just take this thing off? Yeah. But anyway, this is a Russian Jeep. And the way this worked, they would go and uh, drive out and pick somebody up, take them into the Orholm Hospital. They had very little IV supplies or really no EKG, no real capacity to do anything, but they nonetheless had to bring them to the Orholm Hospital. Then they would take them to the Bodon Hospital. 
So we're talking, go out and get them, two hours, two hours back. We'll look at you for an hour or so, then another two hours. Anybody know what the golden hour is? We only have the golden hour to get most people taken care of. After that, we're kind of in deep doo-doo. If you're hemorrhaging, you've had a heart attack, you've been in a bad motor vehicle accident, we really have that golden hour to rescue you. And after that, there's just a lot of complications, even if we do get you to survive. Can everybody hear me? Am I speaking loud enough? Mm -hmm. So this Jeep was lovely. It was also the doctor's transport. They used it for meetings, so it wasn't even always available. Um, they are very proud of this Russian Jeep. Okay, so our first job was education. That is our little classroom. It was about as big as it looks in this picture. And our job was to work with the nurses. And what started out to be what we thought would be a little more complex had to be a little bit more fun and had to be definitely more hands-on. Um, and learn about what they wanted. The gal with the blue hat on was one of our most enthusiastic learners, and she was the cleaning lady. Because in a little hospital, everybody had to pitch in. Um, and it was just a lot of fun. The cook is standing there. The cook was also one of our enthusiastic learners. We had a, a lot of fun stuff. We, uh, this is one of our interpreters acting like a complete doofus. We asked him to pretend he was in an accident, and so he, he did the whole thing. Um, but we transferred. That's uh, our veterinarian that had been along on the trip there helping put the baby scale together for them and some of the donations we took in. Um, you can see they have an old army stretcher. That's their gurney. So they have a lot of antiquated stuff uh, and no running water and no toilets inside their hospital. Just a little, little bit of what we got to do there. Um, we got to meet with the governor. That's the picture of our team meeting with the governor of the area. They put on wonderful celebrations for us. They're the most grateful people in the world. And then it was also Children's Day, so there were these horse races. And I'm too big to get on the horses. Girls aren't allowed to, and up to about the age of 12. Now, any of you horse people out there? Looking at this, what do you see on that horse? And this kid is going like mock speed. He won the race. This was like a, a 10 mile race they ran in. Nothing. These kids are just tearing around. So, healthcare folks, what might be at risk for? Injuries. Yeah, they had a lot of nasty horse accidents. And uh, so you can think of fractures, broken bones, things that are uh, popped ribs. But I'll tell you, that was a thrill to watch these guys race in. This kid, I think that one was. I think he was 10. So, anyway, so after we worked there, we did screenings, we did education, we worked with the folks, then we got on the road. And off we went to uh, bag four. And this was bag four. We set up and did a lot of screenings, had a chance to play some volleyball with the local folks. Uh, this is our cook tent, and that's Oriana there at her dental hygiene station. And then you can see where we were camping. And that was close to where the horses came in. Uh, the cows like my tent. The cows kept eating my tent. Uh, but anyway, it was beautiful, beautiful country. But you can see we were sitting out there thinking, where are the people? We're not really near anything. Who's going to show up? They came. They came on horseback. They came on cars. We had hundreds of people show up. And it's still a mystery to me how they really knew we were there. Because they would come from all over. Uh, and you can see the traditional dress. Uh, they're very... Um, very respectful, very kind people. What was fascinating about Mongolians is how interested and open they are to wanting to learn. You know, a lot of people, it's like, oh, change, I don't know. But they, they begged for learning. They begged for understanding and information. It was just fascinating. Um, so they came by horseback. They came by car. Uh, their herds were behind them. And it, it was just wonderful, just wonderful. Guess what? We packed up again, <laughs> and we uh, headed to bag two. Um, and by the time we got to bag two, we were pretty fried. Uh, there was a nasty dust storm there, and I remember the driver. We said, "Well, is our is our camp still there?" And he said, "Bad condition." <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, um, but that's our camp, our last camp before we headed back to Orhome, and we're doing screenings there as well. 
and that's our interpreter Garrett. He's pretty pretty fried. You can see the dust storm. It was pretty it was pretty nasty. This was the bag nurse. She was the only bag nurse in the whole area for uh, 4,500 people and a huge huge area. Um, and she was amazing. But she also begged. She had no supplies. She had no blood pressure cuffs. She didn't know how to run a screening. Uh, she didn't know, yet, but she did a lot of home visits. She took us on home visits, and they would ask us, what should we do? Uh, it's like their basic infrastructure on some things, like power grids, roads, electricity, solar, phones are there, but then the workforce support is not. So it's a great opportunity for you people interested in global health to think of ways to partner and help here. Uh, they had parties for us. It was just amazing. These gentlemen in the beautiful costumes, after we worked in bag two, they just said, come on, we want to give you a party. They were always giving us parties, and they were always feeding us goats. And um, uh, they would cook on this stove, and uh, the cook, Moggy, she made the most wonderful bread. And but, but I've got to say, by the time we're in our fourth week now of doing these screenings and packing up camp six times and moving, and flooding our camps and our camps being in bad condition. It, it, it got a little tiring and the showers were precious. We paid a dollar for a shower. But you can see the students, we're getting a little worn out. But I wanted to show you, they put these little kids up on horses just about the age of yours, your <laughs> grandchild. And these kids start riding at two. And, and I'm not exaggerating, they're right. And so it's, it's pretty impressive, a culture of horses for sure. So here we were, happy team. Oh, we're on the road again. <laughs> but let's talk about what all this actually means to healthcare and how that can impact maybe a place where public health can work, uh, global health students, wh where do we fit into this? Well, here we are up at a family's farm. That father isn't all that old, the one in the turquoise shirt. Uh, and he's got gray hair because his 19-year-old daughter had a psychotic break at about the age of 15. And they tried to manage caring for her in a gear. And she's just a beautiful young thing, but she runs away. And the mother and the father, they were so loving, they sometimes had to tie her up because the hospitals couldn't help. She was on help, all. and if you know anything about teens and uh, psychotic medica antipsychotic medications, that's taboo. But it's an old, cheap medication, worst thing in the world for this young lady. And she was on Haldol and Florazine. So access to medications, access to therapies just are glaring in this scenario. And that father was so proud of his sheep, but the poor guy was worn out. I don't know how those parents are gonna survive another year. They literally had to run after their daughter. Literally chase her so she would be safe if they let, let her out of their sight. And just a beautiful young girl, probably here in the United States, we could have had her treated and you know balanced in medications in Europe. And so it was really frustrating. This was one of the most heartbreaking things that when you knew what could be done, and and seeing um, this all pretty. Uh, you've heard, I'm sure, in your global public health. I know the student nurses have this whole idea of access when we. And Martin Luther King said, is one of the, to me, the most brilliant comments, is that of all forms of inequity, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And when you're there and you see this beautiful family, you go, this is sickening. We know how to do something about this. So they do have a new Ministry of Health. They kind of turn over. They've got their political challenges. Really, 1992 to 2015 is not very long for a new country. So they have a good vision. They're aware that they've got an aging population. They do have a high increase in hypertension and diabetes. Um, they've got a lot of tuberculosis, and unfortunately, they're seeing plague and rabies, but they're also seeing brucellosis and different um, strains of brucellosis. So they get the idea, they're getting their infrastructure built of a vision and an idea, but they don't have the workforce there yet. So I hope I painted that picture okay. Um, it is a country of uh, 16 horses to one person, but when we think about that, as fun as that is for people who love horses, that implies a lot of hardship kind of living. We know that the top three most dangerous uh, jobs in the United States are the, the fishermen, the loggers, and the farmers and ranchers. You get kicked in the head by horses, you know, bad things happen. So you've got danger. The reason for this photo is obviously it's a long way 
to healthcare. You don't just, you know, maybe, maybe what if you, it was dark and you hit one of these horses and you got in an accident? Because there's nothing fenced. There's animals on the roads everywhere. Well, now what are you going to do? How are you going to get to healthcare? Your car is wrecked in the middle of the night. You know, so that becomes a very pragmatic problem and challenge in healthcare, the distances. Now, they have a lot of environmental challenges because um, they do have limited fresh water sources. Um, only 65% of all rural population has access to, to fresh water. The policies of the former communist regime really uh, promoted this urbanization. Uh, a lot of people, like a million people, have moved into Ulaanbaatar just in the last 20 years. And what, well, you can't just do that to a city that's lacking infrastructure. About 5% of the people in uh, our households in Ulaanbaatar don't have water and don't have electricity. Um, so you end up with disparity within, and, and you create storms, et cetera. So anyway, and then the industrial growth has had a lot of uh, negative effect, affect, and effect, and then they are burning a lot of soft coal because it's cheap and it's available and easy to mine. Uh, there are really no environmental laws. The air is polluted, um, and then they are deforesting uh, pretty rapidly, uh, trying to balance between moving from an agrarian economy that was pretty pretty stable under a communist, uh, you know, everything was pretty dictated what was going to happen, to now trying to catch up with uh, a market economy and how that all plays out. Um, there is a lot of overgrazing problems and uh, a lot of or soil erosion. And of course, it was interesting to me, the Mongolians really wanted to talk to us about um, global warming. And I remember telling one of uh, the farmers, I said, well, you know, in the States, there's some people that don't believe in it. And he said, what? <laughs> you just come live with us. We'll, we'll tell you how the seasons have changed. And it's because they, they really get it. So it's very interesting. And of course, desertification, the go-by is expanding. Uh, all the things are happening. And the mining activities, um, without any kind of regulations, uh, kind of can do what they want to do. And actually, Mongolia has come to be called in this last decade, Mongolia, because it is mineral rich. And so if you have and I'm, I, I'm not putting any figures in any companies, but I can imagine if I'm a large industrialist and I see this opportunity to make a lot of money off a mining product and there's no regulations there, am I going to self-regulate? You know, if, if money's involved, it, it might be a problem. And here's a perfect example of this problem. This is a vast expanse of toxic waste. And we're all familiar with Butte and Anaconda. Now, even in Butte and Anaconda's Haiti, it never made this extent of waste distribution. And this is a copper mine in Indiana. It's mostly Russian run. But there's no environmental, there's no EPA, there's no such thing. And of course, uh, as I understand it from some of what people told me there, there might be some organized crime involved. And therefore, if you come in and say, I'd like to do a study of your environmental impact. Oh, sure, come on in. <laughs> so there's some real, real serious barriers from old ways of doing things, changing over, money to be made. And it's, it's kind of a tenuous thing, but their environment is in great jeopardy because, of course, this then, you could look from up on the mountain where we were down to you just you can see the, the path of death, if you will, of, of where all this water was running to into the river system. So it's a pretty huge deal. And of course, the air pollution is quite significant. You have um, over a million people moving into Ulaanbaatar and having cars. And it's kind of sits sort of like Missoula. It's very similar. It's sitting in kind of a, a basin. So this is Air Dinette, but Ulaanbaatar, um, the pollution, they're burning coal. They've got uh, wood they're burning and there's no kinds of environments. So very impactful on health then. Uh, here in Montana, some of our counties are leading causes of death, a heart disease, stroke, and not cancer, but chronic lung disease. And that's what's happening when they're seeing a rise in asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and things that they hadn't had before. You add that to tuberculosis, brucellosis, and 
one of the leading causes of death is uh, liver cancer. Do you know why? Why? Oh, you have not been in a gear and had a good celebration until you had a good cup of vodka. <laughs> and a few of them. Brings out the singing in all of us, doesn't it, Lauren? Yeah. Okay. So some of the challenges to healthcare. Uh, this was another person that deeply impacted our nursing team. We, um, we met him. This was the cook's husband. He'd been an electrical engineer and a logging truck had tipped over on him and logs. He'd had several operations, but because nobody knew anything about physical therapy or occupational therapy or the hazards of immobility, he had been in bed for 17 years. And there wasn't, this leg is freezing cold. It's necrotic, it needs to come off. But I could not straighten his knee. I couldn't bend his ankle. And he had been laying in one position. He was completely, do you know what contractures are? Yeah. When you have, when you don't move, you know, you don't, you don't use it, you lose it. And you've all gotten stiff after you've sat for a few hours. Well, imagine laying in one spot for 17 years. And the pillows, the bed was about this thick. So he had pressure ulcers. Uh, his catheter was, that's, that went into his bladder, the tube, so he could urinate, went into a giant uh, Coke bottle and that was infected. So we had the privilege of meeting this incredible person and saying, well, you know, there's some things you might be able to do here. So the community got together. We did what was called a staffing. Anybody familiar with that concept? It's where you all get together. It's like this room, we all said, well, okay, look at these problems. Okay, guys, let's bring our best thinking. Because if I said, well, this is what you should do, how is that going to go? Not so good. But if we can empower people to exchange ideas and sit down and think and talk, well, what could you do if? So the community got together and they bought him a big fluffy mattress. One of the uh, healthcare workers volunteered to come in and do little exercises with him each day. They started thinking about, is there a better way we do the catheter, etc. And it wasn't so much about what we did going in. It was a privilege of getting to know them, their challenges and what was missing, and saying, so what could you do if? And it, it was, wasn't that something, Lauren? It's like one of the, <sighs> life, yeah. And he was so happy, so happy. Um, I don't know, it would take about a year to get him on a list to get that leg to come off. And of course, you can see that's all necrotic. So it was, uh, that, that put him in jeopardy. Um, but it was also, he couldn't reposition himself because that leg was so stiff and not, there was no circulation, so it was quite painful to him. But it was just this, literally it was a dead weight. So he couldn't move himself. You know, so it was a very complex thing. You needed medical intervention, but there was a lot of things he could do. So that was pretty cool. Um, again, a lot of the pulling out of one country leaves a lot of devastation in its wake. I took a picture of this old teeter-totter. Uh, obviously, I loved it. I was like, well, this is a functional teeter-totter, by golly. You know, I just thought, that looks very Russian. You know, I, I never built a teeter-totter out of I-beam. You know, this thing's meant to last here. But it's just left. And it's left in weeds. The outside of the buildings are in disrepair. Um, because how does a, a country, when it's trying to rebuild everything, figure out how to take care of maintenance and have the money to do so. And so it, it, individually they're taking care of their, their little apartments, but the infrastructure is old. It has not been upgraded. Probably since this was built, I don't know, some of you my age, this is looking 50-ish kind of architecture. So nothing has been put back into Mongolia. Okay. Um, there's a lot of complementary and alternative medicines. Here we are at the complementary and alternative medicine hospital, and you've got a lot of different opinions about what health care is. Lauren, do you remember what they said was in this bottle with, that we thought they said it was poop? I didn't remember that part. I don't know what it actually was. But yeah, yeah, we all remember that, that we thought this was a, an elixir of poop. <laughs> and so that was our, our, our paradigm for a while, that no, we weren't going to try this. It didn't turn out to be but it was something like that. Um, and 
then they had these bags, and these were quite expensive. Uh, and you have this idea that uh, Western healthcare is bad. Uh, what that, you know, this woman has on the, the beads. Those are shaman beads that she has on. Okay, so you've got a lot of uh, strong opinions. Uh, this was the group after our staffing. Uh, we, we sat and talked and worked things out, and um, they became very empowered. Um, but how do you get a group of people? I mean, you've worked in community building and coalition building and putting groups together to try to get them to solve their own problems. That's really the best, funnest thing to do. And did you have a chance to do that when you worked across borders? Nope. Yeah. That's, that's really, I would, I would like to encourage you that that's more important than we, what we go in and do. Um, this isn't the greatest picture of a gear. There's some more of that goat being cooked there for us. But a gear, when you go in, here's a gear, little baby one. Uh, women live on the right, men live on the left. There are the structures you can kind of see in the center here. Um, the decorations are all pretty typical. You can't walk in between those because then you'll cause a breakup in the house. But the stove sits in the middle and it's set up in such a way that the air circulates around and comes out the room. It, it's really amazing, amazing ingenuity of uh, construction. Um, but they pick up these gears and they move them three and four times every year. Another problem is the lack of uh, supplies and tools and mechanics and all kinds of workforce. So if your hospital lost its EKG machine, there's nobody to fix it. Nobody has a clue what to do with that. Uh, the one electrical engineer for the entire uh, Volgan province I showed you had a logging truck fall on. So uh, I love this. This is uh, Laugen, our driver. And we broke down out in the middle of nowhere. He goes walking off, finds somebody on a horse, comes back with two logs. And I thought, oh, we're going to be out here a long time. And he fixes it with a, a log. The whole um, support system for the engine broke. And, you know, they're very, very, so on a plus side, an asset, they're incredibly in ingenious and, and make things work. But this also points to the lack of availability of services. Uh, this is just to pay homage to goats. Um, they were everywhere. They're, they're beautiful, darling animals. But we actually had to watch our dinner be killed. Uh, five, five goats? All because of us. Yeah. And I thought I knew what Mongolian barbecue is, but I didn't. Another part of my ignorance. I'm going to tell you what Mongolian barbecue is. It is a goat, the whole goat, in a pot with carrots, potatoes, their own kind of um, spices and um, garlic and kind of onion stuff, and a rock for every person that's at dinner. And that all cooks and cooks and cooks in this pressury kind of thing. And um, then it, it's big celebration. It's a celebration how the goat is killed. It's a big celebration how the goat is cooked. And then, because we're the honored guests, we got to bring us peace. <laughs> okay. And, um, you know, five goats, I felt bad because I don't eat goat. But boy, we did, it, you know, it was such an honor. Uh, but do you know what the rocks are for? Oh, well, we learned that too. We each got our own rock hot out of the greasy pot, right into our hands, and you sit there, this is, I know, this is where hot potato came from, because you sit there with this rock, and it's for your health. And you must take your rock after, and it's all part of the honor of cooking, and I, I think maybe it was psychological, I don't know, but afterwards I felt like, oh, I can eat my goat. <laughs> it, it just was, it, there was something kind of cool about the whole ceremony around all of it, and how giving and generous because ladies and gentlemen when they presented a goat for us that was you know remember I told you two thousand dollars a day that was like a like a two hundred dollar dinner they fixed for us it was a huge honor we appreciate it we love the people then the lovely thing that happens they give you uh, there's only one cup and a bottle of vodka and the first the the, the um, host has the cup and We'll ask one of you, like Peter, 
you better have a, they don't say this, but you better have a really good toast because I'm going to give you this cup with vodka in it. Then you will stand up and you will give a, a toast to the host. And if your toast is good, they will applaud and yay and everybody's happy. Uh, otherwise, they'll just take that cup quickly and they'll give it to somebody else. Until so everybody has given a toast, and this may go on for a while if the toasts are really good, and then, uh, Peter, you will sing us a song. <laughs> and guess what? We were so brilliant. Oh, you wouldn't believe the songs these people sang. Oh, my gosh, they were beautiful. Unbelievably complicated a cappella pieces of music. It was just magnificent. One woman whistled a song. It was so, yeah. row, row, row your boat. That's all we could think of. It was pathetic. <laughs> and they look at us, <laughs> and they go, okay. I think we even made it to Kumbaya at one point. Yeah. So, so a lot of uh, tradition. The other reason I wanted to show you this goat is because we stopped there, and immediately our driver got out and started helping shearing the goats. And he said, if you don't help when you visit someone, you will break the back of your child. Meaning, you know, it's just, just be a good neighbor. So anyway, we traveled through all the distances, the complications. Uh, we saw a lot of trucks wrecked. Uh, this stuff turns into gumbo. Uh, there were semis stuck out in the middle of nowhere. One of the, my favorite sites, I lost my camera. Some of these pictures are from the students. But there were two bicyclists out in the middle of nowhere. I thought, oh, those guys are well, I hope they have a spare too. Um, so we got to do a lot of neat things. They appreciated anything we took in. Um, we did a lot of screenings, etc. But the real challenge is you've got health care. They don't have running water. This was their surgical setup. Okay, That's it. No running water. They pour some stuff in basins. Um, and while it's just fascinating and beautiful to see these people, and I don't know if you can tell, that gentleman has a stick. And at the end of the stick is a rope. That's their version of a lasso. They'd get a hold of a, a horse. Then they'd be drug off their horse. Then they'd drag around on the countryside for a while till either, well, I don't know, they ran, the horse would stop. Then they'd take that sash that they have and they'd wrap it around the horse's girth. And then they'd fly on and then they'd go bucking off. You wouldn't see them for quite a while. Then pretty soon here they'd come back again, riding the horse. And so the injuries, the accidents, the exposure to elements, the, the, these guys have to be out there. So the hypothermia, the skin cancers, the, you know, all of the things. Uh, have you guys studied social determinants of health? A little bit? So that we know poverty is a greater killer than heart disease. Because if I can't feed my kids, I can't pay for them to go to school, I can't, I can't, I can't, and that's always part of your life, poverty. You can't rise above your station no matter what you do. That this is a beautiful, inspiring picture to me, but there's so much more to it. There's poverty here. There's hard work here. There's those red stripes on the flag. There's working against the elements. There's every day, every day, every day, every day. There's no Tahiti vacations here. Okay? So how does that really impact a person's health? So there's a lot of opportunities for people to work across borders. The schools welcome exchanges with students. Welcome you. We were told, bring the students. We'll house them. You can come go to school here. We love to learn from you and share. Um, we, the complementary and alternative medicines there, uh, she's got the, the bottles on, the suction bottles on for rheumatoid arthritis. She was just darling. Uh, but there is a lot we could learn about that. They have really advanced that and are doing a lot of research. Um, they did ask us to help create a center of nursing excellence. That's the nurse's station. Um, the table was given to them by Save the Children, and there's a laptop. I think it's so interesting, this um, collision always of modern and, and rustic and, and how we put these pieces together. So how can we do that in this really magnificent country um, of you know, 16 horses to every person. There's a lot of challenges, a lot of opportunities for education. Um, and the reason I mentioned Bill Gates early on is because it's an opening up of an opportunity that hasn't yet existed in Mongolia. You know, people have been waiting to see what's going on politically. And it's really only been in this century that people have started to really go there. 
So thank you for your time and opportunity to do this. I hope I made it within my zone here so you can get to your classes. And are there any questions? Here we have a few minutes for questions. Sure. How long were you there? Five weeks, just shy of five weeks. Just shy of five weeks. How did you make the connection? Bioregions has been going there for uh, 12 years or so. They mostly work on agriculture. But um, it was one of the uh, inter one of the one of the drivers was from that area and asked if they would come over to that valley and just this was the first year a team went to Oral. And so it was through the interpreters. Idea. We actually had the opportunity to visit with uh, some of the health care providers there at the Oral Home Hospital about the possibility of using, because that's one thing I didn't mention to you, another nice leftover thing was government television from the communist regime. But that's pretty handy. And so we talked to them about using that to uh, do just that, uh, to promote health. And uh, M Health and stuff isn't really, they don't really know how to do it yet. They've got to get their workforce built up. There's a lot of capacity there, but I'd say the void is the, the capability and capacity of the workforce just yet. So that's probably a more effective exchange than, than bringing up two nurses to the center of the over there, or really pulling it together uh -huh. and having the television oriented you know, package and then you're trying to do something. Uh huh. Well, I, sh I, I sure respect that. I think one of the that we could do more of was like what we did with the staff. They had to be mentored and shown because it didn't occur to them that there could be a fatter mattress. It didn't occur to them that they could be doing physical therapy. And you know, that to me that was interesting. But and then I started thinking about it. When you've lived under a prescriptive government, it's not safe to think out of the box. It's not safe to innovate. It's not encouraged. But it works for the families. I, I'm, I'm an occupational therapist in the Soviet system. And things like, you know, I'm staying out of the box. It's like there used to be the old belt, right? Right, right. The idea that you could actually make cabin coverings along the lines, you've got all of these coats and sheets, right? Right, exactly. You can along the lines of some of the rugs uh -huh. and use them for padding. Yeah, so you wouldn't have had to have okay. yeah, pressure cookers, but they're so used to the uh -huh. that they don't think about another way of cooking. Right, right. So those kinds of things, and if you talk, I like, bet especially for women, uh -huh. introducing the concept, um, it would spread wildly. Wild, uh -huh. It's called family, family, mm -hmm. um, extended family. Exactly, and that was, that was, I think, our idea was that the staffing, show them, and then let them continue this idea. It's our hope that they've continued the staffings, that they start thinking, well, what could they do for that 19-year-old girl? Have they thought of everything they could think of? Could community members volunteer so the parents do try? You know, and, and are there other things that came along with that young man? You're absolutely right. And I think mentoring um, our group of Nurses for Nurses, we're very, um, determined that doing two is very rare, doing four isn't so often, and it's always with. Yeah. So thank you. Well, let's thank the show. Some of us are going to the meeting of the Repair of the World Coalition and UC 222 right now. So I wanted to tell you about next week. Uh, next week, George Reese is going to be talking about Ebola hemorrhagic fever. And he's going to talk about both his personal experiences and some of the science behind that. And he's in uh, Atlanta right now with CDC, and I think he's going to be reporting back on some of his experiences there as well. So this should be a very interesting uh, lecture next Wednesday night. See that.